let's make sure we got our seat belts fastened and our tray tables in upright position. We are all set for takeoff. So here we go. Welcome to session 10 of chapter 2 of Old Testament history. The God involved history of Isaac, Jacob, and Esau. I am rejoicing at how this class is developing, but we're only halfway through Genesis. <laughs> wow. But that's appropriate because Genesis covers almost two thirds of the time span from Adam to Christ. We are witnessing the presence of God in human history as a counterbalance to the lopsided view we were presented in our secular history classes. God has been at work throughout history following his plan, which he sketched out in the stars. His prophets were focal points, and we are now transitioning from Abraham to Isaac. So please turn to Genesis 24. We're going to read a whole lot tonight. Genesis 24, verse 1. And Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his eldest servant of his house, that ruled over all that he had, so this guy was his steward, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. Huh. This was another seemingly strange custom of those times. And ever since Herodotus, the historian, it has become one of the roles of us historians to point out and explain the weird and sometimes amusing customs of people foreign to us. Abraham asked his eldest servant to grab him by the you-know-what and promised to do an important task. This was a solemn oath to do what was agreed upon because to break that oath would be viewed as kicking him in the you-know-what. We still have a vestige of that custom in the English word testament and testify. You know what that other word is. Genesis 24, verse 3. And I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. But thou shalt go into my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said to him, Peradventure the woman would not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? And Abraham said unto him, Beware that thou bringst not my son thither again. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. And if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this my oath, only bring not my son thither again. And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham his master, and swore unto him concerning that matter. So, this was going to be an arranged marriage. That was the custom of that time and culture. Today, we marry the person we fall in love with, they were taught to fall in love with the person they married. Today, we base much of our spousal choice upon emotions. Their basis was totally rational. The parents knew their kids. They saw them grow up. They knew their strengths and weaknesses. They also had lived life and hopefully had gained wisdom and common sense. So the parents in that culture would get together and match up their kids. Often, families would make alliances and intermarry several of their children. Not only were the personalities, strengths, and weaknesses of the children evaluated and matched, but also the reputations of the families, what they stood for. Therefore, Abraham sent his trusted servant to find a wife for Isaac. 
The servant had been part of the household for the longest period and knew what Abraham stood for and had seen Isaac grow up, knew him too. But Abraham was also believing God to assist in this very important selection. How could Abraham find the very best wife for his son? It was like finding a needle in a haystack. It was like panning for gold. But we shall see that God's unmistakable choice was the easiest decision in the history of decisions for everyone involved. Genesis 24, 10. And the servant took ten camels of the camels of his master, so it was a caravan, and departed, for all the goods of his master were in his hand. So he was the steward of the house. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia under the city of Nahor. And he made his camels to kneel down outside the city by a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day, and show kindness unto my master Abraham. See, here was the task at hand. Number one, he had to find an eligible woman for marriage in an unknown city. Number two, he had to vet her. All that involves. Number three, he had to get an audience with her father. Number four, he had to convince the father that the servant of Abraham was legit. Number five, he had to obtain permission to marry their daughter to an unknown man. Number six, he had to pay a dowry. Number seven, he had to bring her home. Oh, that's easy peasy, isn't it? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, by the way, this was in a culture in which it was not permissible to converse with a woman except for extremely limited reasons. They could ask, may I have a drink of water? They could ask, where does the man of God live? Otherwise, almost everything else was viewed as indecorous behavior. Genesis 24:13. Here he is praying, Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. And let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, Let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she shall say, Drink, for I will give thy camel's drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac. And thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. Verse 15, And it came to pass, before he had even done speaking, that behold, Rebekah came out, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother. Her pitcher was upon her shoulder, and the damsel was very fair to look upon. A virgin neither had any man known her, and she went down to the well, filled her pitcher, and came up. And a servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. And she said, Drink, my lord. And she hasted and let down the pitcher upon her hand and gave him the drink. And when she was done giving him drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels also until they have done drinking. And she hasted and emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran again under the well to draw the water and drew for all of his camels. And the man, wondering <laughs> at her, held his peace to know whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. And it came to pass, as the camels had done drinking, that that man took a golden nose ring of half a shekel weight and two bracelets for her hands of ten shekels weight of gold. That's over four ounces of gold, which is around $7,000 by today's price. And said, Whose daughter are you? Tell me, I pray thee. Is there room in your father's house for us to lodge? And she said, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, which she bore to Nahor. She said, Moreover unto him, We have both 
straw and provender enough and room to lodge in. And the man bowed down his head and worshiped the Lord. Bingo. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth, I being in the, in the way, and the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. This was the easiest decision in the history of decisions. This is how things are supposed to work out, right? When we walk for God, many of us have experienced similar things. Now, I think that it is obvious from the circumstances that she was God's choice. The serendipity of the situation was unmistakable, but Rebecca was Isaac's first cousin. Today, in most countries, marriage of first cousins is illegal, but it was common in ancient times, especially in the Middle East. They thought it was a way to keep their family and the family wealth intact. In fact, in some Middle Eastern countries today, the male first cousin has dibs on the female first cousins, and if they marry someone else, it's only with his permission. Wow! You know that over 40% of married couples in the Arab world are also related to each other. I didn't know that until I researched it. Now, I wonder what Google advertisements I'm going to be besieged with after, after looking that up. Huh? Whoop, whoop. Joke filler engagement in progress. Joke filler engagement in progress. <laughs> I, I can't say anymore. Uh, uh, Genesis 24, 28. And the damsel ran and told them her father and father's house of these things. And Rebecca had a brother and his name was Laban. And Laban ran out unto the man under the well. And it came to pass when he saw the nose ring and the bracelets upon his sister's hands. And when he heard the words of Rebekah, his sister, saying, Thus spake the man unto me, he came unto the man, and behold, he stood by the camels at the well. And he said, Come in, thou blessed of the Lord. What are you standing there outside for? I have prepared the house and the room for the camels. And the man came into the house and ungirded his camels and gave straw and provender for the camels and water to wash his feet, and the men's feet that were with him. And there was set meat before them to eat, but he said, I will not eat until I have told my errand. And he said, Speak on. So the servant told them why he came and described how God answered his prayer. We get down to Genesis twenty four forty nine, And he says, Now, if you will deal kindly and truly, with my master, tell me, and if not, tell me, that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. And Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing proceeds from the Lord, and we can't speak unto thee bad or good. <laughs> it was that obvious. Behold, Rebekah is before thee. Take her and go. Let her be your master's son's wife as the Lord has spoken. Boom! They made their decision that quick. Wow! And it came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard their words, he worshipped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. And the servant brought forth jewels of gold and silver and raiment and gave them to Rebekah. And he gave them also to her brother and to her mother, precious things. Ding, 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 ding. More bling. Bonanza, because Abe was rich. That was the dowry. And they did eat and drink, and he and the men that were with him, and tarried all night. And they rose up in the morning, and he said, Send me away unto my master. And her brother and her mother said, Well, let the damsel abide with us a few days, at least ten. And after that she shall go, because, you know, everything happens so quick. And he said to them, Hinder me not seeing the Lord hath prospered my way, send me away that I may go to my master. See, they had had a covenant of salt at that meal. Okay? And they said, well, let's call the damsel and inquire at her mouth. What do you want to do? And they called Rebekah and said to her, 
will you go with this man now? And she said, I will go. Ha, huh, wow. That was brave, wasn't it? But it indicated her faith, her quality. And they sent away Rebecca, their sister and her nurse and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebecca and said to her, thou art our sister be thou mother of thousands of millions and let your seed possess the gate of those who hate them and rebecca arose and her damsels and they rode upon the camels and followed the man and the servant took rebecca and went his way huh wow she just says see ya i'm gonna get married <laughs> and she hadn't even met her husband yet how brave but she indeed was a remarkable woman. Now, of course, that seems so strange to us, but that was okay in their culture. But because of the circumstances, it was the easiest decision in the history of decisions. And it also was an indication of her believing and trusting God. Genesis 24, 62. And Isaac came from the way of the well of Lahorai, for he dwelt in the south country. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at evening, and he lifted up his eyes and saw, behold, camels were coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel, for she said unto her servant, What man is this that walks in the field to meet us? And the servant said, It's my master. Therefore, she took a veil and covered herself because they're not supposed to look at you until you get married. And the servant told Isaac all things that he had done. And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah and she became his wife and he loved her. Perfect fit. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. So Genesis chapter 25 covers the rest of Abraham's life. He marries another wife, Keturah, and founded other nations. And verse 7, and these are the days of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived, a hundred and three score and fifteen years. So, one hundred and seventy-five years. Then Abraham gave up the ghost and died a good old age, an old man, and full of years and was gathered to his people. And his sons, Isaac and Ishmael, buried him in the cave of Machpelah, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar, the Hittite, which is before Mamre, same place that Sarah was buried. The field which Abraham purchased of the sons of Heth, there was Abraham buried and Sarah, his wife. And it came to pass after the death of Abraham, that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac dwelt by the well Lahar-oi. Now, we know where this cave is in Hebron at Machpelah, and it has been a holy site for hundreds of years to all the religions who honor Abraham. It's the second most holy site to Jews from the temple. It also, unfortunately, is, is, has been contested between the religions. It originally was a Jewish pilgrim site. Then Herod commemorated it with the building. And then the Christians shared it with the Jews. Then the city was captured by the Arab Muslims. And the basilica there was converted into a mosque. But they also permitted two small synagogues at the site. Then it was captured by the Crusaders, and both Muslims and Jews were banned. Eighty-seven years later, Saladin captured it for Islam and allowed Christians to visit, and the buildings were later enlarged, but Jews were only permitted as close as the seventh step on the stairway into the building that covered the cave entrance. The Ottomans restored the site but jealously guarded it against foreigners. And when Jordan, the country of Jordan, took control in 1948, no Jews were allowed. Then Israel 
occupied the West Bank after the Six Day War in 1967. And one of the first things they did is tore the doors off the mosque. And later a synagogue was established there. And that stone stairway that contained the humiliating seventh step was destroyed. Since then, there have been a number of tit-for-tat deadly attacks on both Jews and Muslims at the site. It's currently maintained by a Muslim waqf, W-A-Q-F. That's a perennial charitable trust which controls most of the building. It's supposed to be, in effect, forever unalterable. So, a lot of things, though, have happened in that area that have violated these kinds of waqf trusts that are supposed to be forever unalterable and the Jews have come in and changed it and that's one of the reasons why things are at a fever pitch over there because the Islamic people believe that it's supposed to be forever unalterable so you can see the depth of their feelings regarding some of these things but that trust controls most of the building it's now open to tourists However, during the the week that I was in Israel, in 2001, we weren't permitted to go there into the Palestinian Authority area. The Jews are permitted in some areas of the building now, but other areas only on 10 Jewish high days of the year. And the site is currently patrolled by Israeli Defense Forces. I'm going to provide a PDF on the modern findings that were in the caves underneath the building. Now we're going to return to Genesis 25 and verse 12. Genesis 25 and verse 12 through 18 are the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian Sarah's handmaid bear unto him. They talk about his 12 sons who were the founders of the tribes of the Arabs, another nation founded by Abraham. Now we get to verse 19. And these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel the Syrian of Padan Aram, and the sister to Laban the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah his wife conceived, and children struggled together within her. And she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Ouch. (laughs) And, And two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red, all over like a hairy garment. And they called his name Esau. That means hairy. And after that came his brother out. And his hand took hold on Esau's heel. And so his name was called Jacob, which means grabber. Or Bullinger has heel snatcher or contender and Isaac was three score years old when she bare them and the boys grew and Esau was a cunning hunter a man of the field and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents now it says Jacob was a plain man the word plain does not do Jacob justice it is the Hebrew word tom t-o-m which means morally sound, having integrity, wholesome. It is what Jesus taught about in the Sermon on the Mount, that our eye be single, our spiritual outlook not be duplicious, not having ulterior motive. That's what that is. On the other hand, Esau was a man of the field, a man of the world. I think Jacob has been misrepresented because of his name. Because here God says he had integrity. 
But people throughout history think he was living up to his name, especially by this next incident of bargaining for the birthright. But you know what? All he was doing was acting on the prophecy about him that his mother had certainly told him about. The elder would serve the younger. Genesis 25, 28. Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, wild meat. But Rebekah loved Jacob. And Jacob boiled or cooked stew. And Esau came from the field and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee, with some of that red stew. Now the REV Bible has a more vivid translation. It's please let me gulp down that red stuff, that red stuff. It's repeated. Therefore, his name is called Red, Edom. And Jacob said, first, sell me this day your birthright. And Esau said, ah, behold, I'm at the point to die. What doth that profit me, that birthright to me? And Jacob said, swear me this day first. And he swore unto him. And he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Now, this may seem strange to us until we understand it from a spiritual perspective. Abraham was a rich man, and he gave all his riches to Isaac. Isaac had twin sons. By custom, a double portion of the inheritance was given to the firstborn. Esau was only a few minutes older, but he was the firstborn. In addition, the birthright conveyed the rulership of the family into the next generation. Bullinger says in the Companion Bible that it also conferred the quote-unquote domestic priesthood which is the position of being the spiritual head of the family. So the birthright was very important, but it wasn't valued very much by Esau. A comment in the REV commentary adds more understanding. They say Esau came home very hungry and was insistent to get some of Jacob's stew as quickly as possible. Please let me gulp down that red stuff. That red stuff. The word red stuff is repeated for emphasis. Like we'd say, I'm starving. I'm starving. Then the REV commentary says, Jacob picked up on his desperation and hence placed such a high price on the meal. But Esau complied. And in that culture, your words were binding Therefore, Jacob did not cheat his brother out of it. A bargain was made. Esau agreed. The main point is Esau just didn't value it very much. Now, I'm going to add my commentary to that because this is God-involved history, all right? One of the themes of the Old Testament is the spiritual record. Another is the genealogical record, the Christ line. This incident involves both. God made a covenant with Abraham, promising that he and his descendants would receive the promised land, and in him would all families of the earth be blessed. That is, the Messiah would come through him. So this became the family business. God promised the same to Isaac. The birthright included the double portion of the inheritance and the guardianship of the family, and those were tools to that end. Also, God dealt with the heads of the family in the patriarchal administration. That involved the domestic priesthood, because they decided who and how the family worshipped. That is all which Esau despised. He was a man of the field, a man of the earth. But Jacob was a plain, actually a pure-hearted man. 
Both he and his mother knew that he would carry on the family business far better than Esau. That is why God declared in Malachi chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, and in Romans, Jacob have I loved, but Esau I hated. Why? Because he despised the family business. Genesis 26, verse 1. There was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, into Gerar. The rest of the chapter deals with Isaac and the king of Gerar. We get down to verse 34. Genesis 26, 34. And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beri the Hittite, and Bashama, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, which were a grief of mind unto Isaac and to Rebekah. Well, because that marriage didn't bode well for the family business. The Hittites worshiped false gods. Now we come to Genesis 27. That records the blessing that Isaac gave his sons before he died. I think most commentators give Jacob a bad rap, calling him a cheater. But one must realize Esau had sold him his birthright that included this blessing. Those words, that oral agreement, was binding. But Esau was backing out on it when he sought his father's blessing. Furthermore, Jacob did not concoct that plan. His mother did. Isaac was elderly and not spiritually sharp. He was blind, too. And Rebekah knew who should carry on the family business best. So it came to pass, Genesis 27, verse 1, came to pass when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim, so that he could not see. He called Esau, his eldest son, and said to him, My son. And he said, And behold, here I am. And he said, Behold, now I am old. I know not the day of my death. Now therefore I take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver, and thy bow. Go out into the field and make me some of that savory meat, that venison, wild game meat, such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee, before I die. So this was the blessing. The father's blessing was like a last will and testament. And it was legally binding too, like an oral contract. Their words were their bond. And it did not matter what the circumstances were. They were legally binding once pronounced. Rebecca overheard the conversation and knew it was necessary for the family business, that Jacob received the blessing, so she told Jacob what to do. She told him to do this. Genesis 27, verse 5. And Rebekah heard when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son, and Esau went out into the field to hunt for venison, wild game. And Rebekah spake to Jacob, her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau, thy brother, saying, Bring me venison that I make me savory meat that I may eat and bless thee before the Lord before my death. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. Go now to the flock, fetch me from thence two good kids of the goats, and I'll make them savory meat for thy father such as he loves. And thou shalt bring it to thy father that he may eat and that he may bless you before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Behold, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I'm a smooth man. My father, peradventure, will feel me, and it shall seem to him as a deceiver, and I will bring a curse upon me, and not a blessing. And his mother said to him, Upon me be thy curse, my son. Only obey my voice, and go fetch me them. So he went and fetched and brought them to his mother. His mother made savory meat, like his father loves. And Rebekah took goodly raiment of her eldest son, Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them upon Jacob, her younger son. And she put the skins of the kids of the goats upon his hands 
and upon the smooth of his neck. And she gave the savory meat and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. And he came to his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who art thou, my son? And Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, thy firstborn. I have done according as thou badest me. Arise, I pray thee, sit and eat of my venison, that thy soul may bless me. And Isaac said to his son, How is it that you found it so quick? And he said, Because Lord thy God brought it to me. And Isaac said to Jacob, Come near, I pray thee, that I may feel thee, my son, whether thou be my very son Esau or not. And Jacob went near unto Isaac his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he discerned him not, because his hands were hairy as his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. And he said, Art thou my very son Esau? And he said, I am. And then he said, Bring it near to me, and I will eat of my son's venison, that my soul may bless thee. And he brought it near to him, and he did eat, and he brought him wine, and he drank. And his father Isaac said to him, Come near now, and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his raiment, and blessed him, and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field which the Lord hath blessed. Therefore God will give thee of the dew of heaven, and the fatness of the earth, and the plenty of corn and wine, all the provisions of the house. Let people serve thee, and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren. There it is. And let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that curses thee, and blessed be he that blesses thee. This was a legally binding last will and testament and blessing and it gave Jacob the leadership over the clan, the resources of the house, and those were the things that Christ's line would need in the difficult times to come. Verse 30, came to pass soon as Isaac had made an end of blessing, Jacob, and Jacob was scarce gone out of the presence of Isaac his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. And he also had made savory meat and brought it unto his father. And he said to his father, let my father arise, and eat of his son's venison, that thy soul may bless me. And Isaac, his father, said to him, Who are you? And he said, I am thy son, thy firstborn Esau. And Isaac trembled very exceedingly and said, Who? Where is he that hath taken venison and brought it me? And I have eaten all before thou came, and I have blessed him. Yea, man, and he shall be blessed. See, it was binding. And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great, exceeding, bitter cry. And he said, Bless me, father. Bless me, O my father. And he said, Thy brother came in with subtlety and had taken away your blessing. And Esau said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took my birthright. Well, was that true? No. And behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. And he said, have you not reserved the blessing for me? Well, had he taken the birthright? That included the blessing, too. No. Esau had despised it and sold it for cheap. Verse 37. And Isaac answered and said to Esau, Behold, I've made him your Lord, and all his brethren have I given to him for servants, and with corn and wine have I sustained him. And what shall I now unto thee, my son? What shall I do? And Esau said to his father, Do you have but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And Isaac his father answered him and said unto him, Behold, your dwelling shall be far away from the fatness of the earth, and far away from the dew of heaven from above. And by your sword shalt thou live, and thou shalt serve your brother. And it shall come to pass, when thou shalt have the dominion, that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. Wow. So Jacob inherited the best land that belonged to Abraham and Isaac. 
And Esau got the desert. Wow. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand, and then I will slay my brother Jacob. So he planned to murder him after Isaac died. And these words of Esau, her elder son, were told to Rebekah. And she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said, Behold, your brother Esau, as touching thee, doth comfort himself, proposing to kill you. Now therefore, in my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee thou to Laban, my brother, to Haran. So then, Rebekah makes some other arrangements. She told Jacob to flee, but she told Isaac to let him go to go get a wife from relatives. So Jacob was even able to secretly leave for safety, but still have his father's blessing. Uh, Genesis 28, 1. That was all Rebecca's plan, not Jacob. So Genesis 28, verse 1. And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padam Aram, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, my mother's brother. And God Almighty bless thee and make thee fruitful and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people. And give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee and to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger, which God gave unto Abraham. See, that was all the consequence of the blessing earlier. And Isaac sent away Jacob, and he went to Badan Aram unto Laban, son of Bethuel the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob and Esau's mother. And when Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padanaram to take him a wife from thence, and that he blessed him and he gave him charge, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan, and that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and was gone to Padanaram. And Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac, his father, then went Esau to Ishmael and took unto the wives which he had, Mahala, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebajoth, to be his wife. So Esau now got another wife from a better source in an effort to please Isaac. But he went to the other side of the family and got a daughter of Ishmael, another cousin. Genesis 28, verse 10. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lit upon a certain place, and tarried there all night, because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place, and put them for his pillows, to lay down in that place to sleep. This is about fifty miles north of where they were when he started. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder, and it's actually a stairway, set up upon the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, Here I am, the Lord God of Abraham thy father, the God of Isaac in the land wherein thou liest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth. And thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. There it is. Abraham's promise, the covenant, reiterated. And behold, I am with thee, and I will keep thee in all places, whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. Huh, that's, that's almost like the prophecies we heard at the beginning of the meeting, isn't it? Wow. Now let's think. If Jacob was this great conniver, manipulator, and sinner, as some say, would he have received this revelation? God repeated the covenant and the promise to him. 
Jacob saw that the land where he had slept was a place upon which angels ascended and descended. What does that mean? That it was a focal point of heavenly action, provision, and protection. It was a promised land. Angels came and went to and from it. Do you see the spiritual significance communicated by that vision? And Jacob waked out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I didn't know it. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful, how awesome is this place. It is none other but the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillow. And he set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. Just happened to have some pillar oil with it, right? <laughs> and he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God be will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I've set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth, yes, a tenth, unto thee. That word tenth is repeated there too for emphasis. Thus, Jacob was now locked in solid to the family business. I don't think he was the conniver and the sinner that everyone has made him out to be because he is God's man in the family business of fulfilling the promise to Abraham. This is true. God involved history, not religious traditions, because he'd always had the integrity, like the word said, and now he has the commitment and the birthright and the blessing and God didn't break his own rules to bless Jacob in spite of supposed shortcomings. No. Jacob applied biblical principles and got biblical results. I mean, what would you do if you had been given a name like his? Grabber. I think he was motivated to outshine that name. I understand that. I was called bad names by bullies for years. But I knew they weren't true. So I maintained my positive self-worth by outshining my detractors. I tried to excel in everything I did. I was driven to prove that I was not who they said I was. And when I found God, I finally was able to jettison the anger, and then I blossomed. I think Jacob was driven too. He had managed to do everything he was supposed to do, but now here he stood all alone. We shall now see him blossom and receive the blessing of the Lord that people of integrity have. We're going to see it in full Technicolor with Panavision and Dolby Sound. Here we stand too with blessings from the same God. So do you need to be blessed? Just listen. But first we're going to take a break, right? Let's take a break. Bless you. 